years. So when I said you will see me, you may see me, but you may see another one here. Uh, I'm a docent, which is just a fancy word for um, a person who's going to explain the museum and welcome you and talk to you about it uh, as much as, as you would like or as little as you would like. Um, this is a picture of me with my two grandchildren um, opening the museum. And this is one of the joys that I have as, as a volunteer is to be able to share this experience with my grandkids. So these two are in Mechanicsburg. They're not that far away. Uh, Natalie and Charlie, they love to come up with me and I let them sit at the docent desk with me. And you didn't know that because I let them sit at the desk. <laughs> and, and they can help me welcome people to the museum and even uh, talk to them uh, about what they're about to see. So uh, Jane, my wife and I, first found out about the museum when we were section hiking Pennsylvania. So we've sectioned hiked the whole state. I think we started in 2017. I think it took us until 2020 to get to this point, uh, southbound. So we walked into um, Pine Grove Furnace State Park. Uh, it's it's south, about 35 miles southwest of Harrisburg, I guess. And, um, and we came across the, the museum and uh, decided to, to drop in and, and we were gonna camp there that night. And uh, we enjoyed it enough to, to come back intentionally two years later in 2021, uh, this time just to spend more time in the museum and just and to camp out. Um, by this time we had a camper van because we were getting so far away from home uh, that we didn't wanna go home after, after every day on the trail. So we would, we would sleep out in that. Um, I walked in and talked to the docents that day in 2021 and explained that we'd been to the museum on our section night and enjoyed it. And, and uh, Jennifer, the docent, asked if I'd ever considered volunteering at the museum. Of course, I had not. Um, and I just left with that idea planted in my head uh, and came back the next day and said, I thought about it. And the answer is yes. I'd like to, like, to don't, like to be here at the museum. I really like it here. Uh, she signed me up with uh, Julie Queen, who is our manager. I uh, did a training session, and I'll be getting the this year. I'll be beginning my third year now uh, as a docent at the museum. Um, it, it's really fun. One of the uh, projects that I've undertaken uh, as as a uh, as a museum volunteer, in addition to being a docent, is to follow up on Larry's long held a desire to have an oral history project called the museum where hikers can come through and record, um, let's say a five minute message about why they're hiking the trail, what they've, uh, what they've learned, uh, tell us their trail name, tell us a little bit about their experiences on the trail. And so I thought, uh, yeah, I, I can do that. Why can't we do that? You know, we'll have that run up and running next summer. And we did. So it's, it's available now. Um, so what I did was tonight, I brought two examples of oral histories that people have made um, for us at the museum. Uh, the first one, her trail name is Curly, walked in the door when I was the docent one afternoon and, and um, it was pretty quiet in the museum right then and I was able to talk to her personally and I noticed right away that she was wearing a t-shirt. It didn't register with me right away what it meant though. Uh, it said triple crown. And uh, Curly, I would guess she's in her 80s. She was a spry lady, you know, but I didn't think of her as a triple crowner. But it turns out that she is a triple She started telling me her, short, her story. I'm sure you know that a triple crowner is a person who's hiked the Pacific Crest Trail, the Appalachian Trail, and the Continental Divide Trail. And she had done all three. And she wanted me to hear about it. And she was so glad that that the museum was open and she could talk to somebody about her experience. And I thought to myself, wait, I need to get this on video. Curly, would you mind sitting over here and I'll hold the camera for you? And would you just talk to us for five minutes about your experiences? And she said she would do it and she did. So I'd like to play you that little video. In 1992, Curly, my trail name, hiked the Appalachian Trail with two other women. It was a dream come true. My husband gave me my trail name and if, they, if he hadn't done it, they would have called me the back lady after Lucy Ball's homeless movie. And so we had 
a great time and we learned a lot on the AT. At first I, I hiked with these two women, then I hiked with two men, and then I hiked solo starting from Connecticut to Baxter State Park, Maine. One of my funny stories that I would like to share with you is, I forgot to uh, take my gob out of my backpack as you are supposed to empty it with all the food that's in there. And then the next day we met for lunch and there was a couple of other hikers that stayed with us in the lean-to. He said, what is this? The mouse had transferred all night long my gob into his backpack. Can you believe such a story? <laughs> Why into his backpack? You know, so that story I, I never I never forgot. Um, yeah, so it was a, a dream come true. And I must say that meeting all these people on the AT and all the other people with trail magic, which was pretty limited in 19... 92, a can of soda was already big time. You would brag about it. You got a can of soda uh, was good. So it kind of renewed my faith in mankind. Man is better than we think, helpful, etc., and, and caring. And I also <clears throat> want to emphasize that it is your hike, nobody else's. Whatever you do is that you accomplish. Let no one criticize you that, oh, you know, you uh, you did, I uh, uh, can't think of anything like that. Oh, you did slack packing. Slack packing is you hike without your pack and somebody meets you at the end of your arranged appointment. So one of my friends who later hiked the AT tried to criticize me. This is an example. You cheated. It doesn't, that's not the issue. It's your hike. There's one thing I learned from hiking the AT. Don't criticize anybody. Everybody does the best that they can. So my accent that you hear here is German. I immigrated to the United States in 1960. Now, while we're doing the interview, it is 2023. So my hike was 31 years ago. And then one thing led to another that I did not plan at all for, I eventually became a triple crowner, hiking the AT, PCT, and Continental Divide Trail in that order. I had no plans to do it, but then one day it hit me and I did it. So that was probably a big surprise that came out of hiking the AT. And this kind of concludes my little nostalgic talk of becoming a long distance hiker, Curly, AT, 1992. So thank you, Curly. Uh, <laughs> she, and, you know, this is all totally un unrehearsed, unprepared, no notes. She just said yes when I asked if she would sit down and talk to us about her, about her trail experience, 81 years old. Um, Another volunteer that I work with at the museum, her name is Sarah Robinson, but she's she goes by uh, Serendipity. Serendipity is her trail name. Um, she she and I were were sharing duties one afternoon when um, a man came in the door, and uh, we we're you know getting ready to say hello, but right away I could tell that something was different about this visitor because uh, he and Serendipity knew each other. Not only did they know each other. They'd gone to high school together. They'd lived in the same neighborhood. You know, they're from Pittsburgh. It, was, it just goes on and on. And so it was a big reunion for those two. And it was fun to see. Um, 
but as uh, as he as he came in, it, it became apparent that there was something wrong. And uh, w what had happened? And he he was hiking as a through hiker. The uh, the town of uh, you know the this, the uh, state park has the general store near the museum where where hikers celebrate the half gallon challenge, which is where you sit down and you eat a half gallon of ice cream in one sitting as fast as you can. The problem with that particular day was the um, general store was closed and he wasn't able to do that. And he was just, uh, you know, crestfallen. And uh, I thought to myself, well, you know, I've got the little camper van over there and uh, it's got, it's full of Luigi's, which happens to be you know, pretty much, you know, Italian ice dessert. I love them. You know, it's no substitute for a half gallon. I understand, but, you know, I'll offer him that and see what happens. And, and of course, he's, he's going to turn down, you know, any kind of dessert. <laughs> so, of course, he's not. So he, I, I bring in the, the half gallon, or not, it wasn't a half gallon. I bring in my Luigi's. He, um, he, he, he you know, he, he eats it and he's happy. And out of that whole experience, um, I get the trail name, which you might guess by now, is Luigi's. This is how uh -huh. people get the trail names. <laughs> Um, so, uh, I wanted you to, to meet, uh, uh, Dips. She also did one of her, uh, her serendipity became Dips, because I, Dips, because hikers are really very lazy in spite of the fact that, and she'll tell you, she'll tell you they're lazy. You wouldn't think so, right? Because they work pretty darn hard on, hard on that trail. But if you're serendipity, you're Dips right away. So, <laughs> so, um, let's hear what she has to say. Hey there. My trail name is Serendipity, which was quickly shortened to Dips, like Mike to Michael, just because hikers are lazy. The story behind it is that, as the trail does always provide, I was repeatedly put in situations that people helped me and I helped others in very uncanny ways, and so that's how I got Serendipity. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And when I'm not hiking, I'm a nurse anesthetist. So I put people to sleep for surgeries that they need. And it's a testament to my love for using my right and left brain, both science and creativity with hiking. My trail friends would describe me as number one, slow, slow and steady, funny, humble, um, giving, gullible, um, and sometimes they called me trips instead of dips because I wasn't too steady on my feet. What would I have done differently? Um, I think that it's difficult to start in Georgia and have this goal of Maine and feel like you have all the time in the world. So I took a lot of time off in the beginning, both to take care of my body, but also because I had been in a very rigorous workforce for 17 years. So it was fun to wake up at 10 a.m. and have two cups of coffee to a sunrise and take a couple of days off in town to enjoy like different scenes and get to know people in those communities. And it was like the second lease on life as a 42 year old woman. And then the closer I got to then Virginia, Pennsylvania, to New England and Maine became in my radar, I realized that I was worried about Katahdin closing prior to my arrival there and I was really committed not to do a flip-flop and to continue in like a straight northern trajectory and so what I would do differently would be to take day less days off at the beginning of the hike and have less stress at the end to be under like less of a time crunch and to be able to take two days off in the hundred mile wilderness in September and swim in a lake and not be running to the end point. Challenges and rewards. Um, I would sum that up by saying that the physical, mental, and emotional challenges that the trail inevitably 
challenges you with and hands to you reap their own rewards, um, becoming physically stronger than ever, um, losing the fear of being alone, losing the fear of feeling incapable to do difficult things. The trail kind of trains you. Um, it trains your legs and your muscles and it trains your mind and your heart to just keep going. Um, I was surprised, the biggest surprise I had on the trail was that when I began, I was, I needed a plan, um, I needed lists, I needed predictability, and by the end of the trail, I was dyeing my hair pink with no food, sleeping on the floor of a Motel 6 in New Jersey with 12 people on my sleeping pad. So I was surprised at how it allowed me to unleash myself. And I say that my life was ruined in the most beautiful way on March 18th of 2021. We can't unsee what we've seen on the Appalachian Trail and taking on a through hike. And it sculpts our lives moving forward, but I wouldn't have it any differently. So whenever I leave my stint, and usually I stay for a number of days because I don't live close. So I take the camper van and I park it in the show, the show forest, uh, Piney Mountain parking area, and I sleep there. And then I come down the mountain for two miles every day and work in the museum. And then I'll, I'll do that for, for several days running. And it'll be uh, like my job for that period of time. And, Whenever I come home, um, I, without exception, I come home with stories, stories that I think are worth remembering, and stories like these, um, and things that I've experienced while, while I'm at the museum. So I would say that that museum is both a place, and it's a place full of people. If you attach yourself to it, you'll love both aspects of it. The museum and all that it involves and the people that are involved, both the other people we are volunteering with and the hikers. And with that, I would like to introduce Larry Luckenberg and he's going to, Luxembourg and he's going to help uh, talk about the museum itself. Larry is the president and the founder of the museum. He's been involved for how long? <laughs> I don't know, uh, many years uh, prior. The museum itself, uh, if you caught the date, has has only been um, in existence since 2010. So it's not an old institution. And Larry had, had this, has had this dream for much longer than that and helped bring it into being. Okay, well, well, thanks, Greg. And, and I'm gonna correct one thing. Greg is close to the museum. <laughs> He's only two hours away. <laughs> so, so I, I live in New York near um, the Hudson River where the AT goes across the Hudson. So for me, it's 226 miles one way to the museum. <laughs> okay, I'm staying corrected. <laughs> okay, so so the, these slides are part of a talk I did on the 75th anniversary of, of the AT. But, and, and I talked here about how the Appalachian Trail went from being an idea to an icon. But, but you can also take the, the museum as going from an idea to, to an icon. So even though it isn't that old, it really seems like a natural place on the AT. It seems like it's been there for a long time. It's part of the community of the AT. Um, this, this was a, a cartoon from the New Yorker in the early 1980s. I reprinted it in my book. And, and they had me in mind. It shows two backpackers at a cocktail party. And it says, years ago, they hiked the Appalachian Trail and they've never stopped talking about it. <laughs> so so they, they nailed me to a T. Um, just a, a few slides on the AT, there's one for the uh, We have tons of signs like this in the museum and we collect more. We have a big storage area in, in Carlisle and we're constantly collecting. Um, I got an offer tonight of, of two boxes from one of the AT's good historians who's in the audience tonight. 
So, so thanks uh, to Barb. Um, but we're always collecting. Um, the Appalachian Trail got started uh, right here in 1922. That's Bear Mountain in New York. The first stretch of the AT was was built in Harriman Park, 1922 and 1923. Um, is anybody familiar with the Hudson Guild Farm in New Jersey? Okay, one. So um, if you drive on, on Route 80 from the Delaware Water Gap into to uh, New Jersey, you'll see a sign for Netcon, New Jersey. And, and that's um, at Netcon, New Jersey, the Hudson Guild Farm, that's where the founder of the DAT, uh, Ben Mackay, first proposed uh, the idea of an Appalachian Trail um, in, in 1921, July 1921. So only about a half hour from here. Um, this is in Harriman Park, the lemon squeezer. It's one of the few uh, features that's been on the AT since the very beginning. So this is on that first stretch of the AT uh, in New York. We have a lot of those metal markers uh, in the collection of, of the AT Museum. Those were designed by um, the first chairman of the Appalachian uh, Trail, Major Welch, who was the general manager of, of Harriman Park and uh, first chairman of the, the AT. And, and also, uh, he was part of the committee that um, decided on Great Smokies and Shenandoah as uh, two of the first national parks in the East. Um, here you, you see some hikers completing the, the, the trail in Catan, and then you see the emotion. Um, the, the sign they're standing by, we, we have in the museum, we have an, a, a sign. Um, it gets very weathered on top of Catan, and so they replace the sign about every 10 years. So we have a, a, a sign that was uh, uh, taken down around uh, 2000. And, and there you, you see that sign in the museum. So we, we have a, 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 a sign that was, it's, it hasn't been at Springer Mountain, but it's identical. It was uh, a, a duplicate of one at Springer. And in the case uh, is a, a two pound bronze uh, marker that was on Center Point Knob near Boylan Springs. Um, so, so that was the geographic center of, of the AT in the 1930s. And sometime in the 30s or 40s, that sign disappeared. Uh, it was bolted to a boulder um, and somebody decided uh, that wasn't a good place for it. And a, a farmer near Boiling Springs was digging up a uh, fence post and he did something solid and, and he uncovered that sign and um, didn't know what it was. So he, he took it home, put it on his mantle. And one of our museum volunteers um, is a carpenter was working on the house and immediately recognized it. And the day of the grand opening of the museum, uh, National Trails Day in 2010, the volunteer presented that to me right before a grand open. So um, here you see most of Ben Mackay and Myron Avery. This, this was uh, our original exhibit. We, we opened uh, with, with an exhibit in, at ATC headquarters in Harpers Ferry in 2010. And we had an exhibit on the two founders, Ben Mackay and Myron Avery. Um, and, and I believe this picture was taken at Bake of the Knob around 1936. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's um, if, if anybody has a different date, you know. Uh, it, it was taken in 1931. 31? When they dedicated the newly built section of the AT. And, and there was a big crowd that day with hundreds of thousands. I can show you the newspaper. Yes, sir. Oh, I'd love to see it. But anyway, I believe that's the only known picture of the two of them. You know, later on, they had a schism and, and never reconciled. But, uh, Myron Avery died young at age 52, and the two of them never reconciled. 
Oh, so here's the complete picture. They're standing by the building that was near the um, tower that was up there. That was the building associated with the tower. And originally, I believe the picture had a third person on it uh, thing, but that's a rough version of the thing. So Eugene Duncan, one of the founders of, of Blue Mountain Eagle. Of the Blue Mountain Eagle. Yeah, okay. But I'm not sure, but I think so. But it, it's it's a great photo, mm -hmm. and it, it's just hard to believe that's the, the only one that survives of the two of them. Um, Myron Avery in the center, this is a classic photo uh, on top of uh, Catan. So, so this was in the early 30s when uh, people from the Potomac Appalachian Trail Club founded the main Appalachian Trail Club and, and scouted the AT through, uh, through Maine. So that that wheel uh, was destroyed in a fire, but the Tennessee Eastman Hiking Club had a wheel that, that Myron Avery had used and presented at one point to Tennessee Eastman. So we, we do have that, that wheel on exhibit at the museum, and that's the only surviving wheel that I know of that, that Myron Avery had used to scout the trail. Myron Avery, by the way, pieced together the whole trail and supposedly hiked the whole 2,000 miles by 1936, supposedly the first one uh, to do the whole trail. So, so the AT wasn't completed till the following year, but, but he hiked the, the whole route. You know, and here you see um, Myron uh, taking notes and with the wheel. He was also, you know, helpful in, in putting together the, the first guidebook. So much of, of what what they did for the AT, they had to invent you know, guidebooks, shelters, uh, all the things that we think of naturally as, as part of a long distance trail didn't exist uh, before Myron Avery and the other volunteers, you know, came up with these ideas for the AT. And the AT, of course, has been emulated around the world. You know, lots of other long distance trails have, have consciously copied the AT. So here you see the, the Tennessee Eastman hiking uh, wheel in the exhibit at the AT Museum. And that's an ax that, that Avery did and, and some goggles. Um, they, they were donated uh, by one of Myron's uh, two surviving sons. My, Myron was uh, a native of Maine, back in Maine, and died there, near there of a heart attack uh, in 1952. Uh, we were talking about Rodell Press earlier. So this is um, a, a, a two-volume set, uh, really one of the, the first great books on, on the AT. So they, they put together a lot of the very early hiker stories. Um, so, so that was uh, done by Rodell when it was based in Emmaus. So th this picture um, was taken in the Appalachian Trail. Uh, biennial conference in, in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Well, Barb, were you there? No. Um, so this was the first time there were enough through hikers to have a picture like this. Mm -hmm. So the first through hiker uh, did the whole trail, Earl Schaefer, uh, who's in the middle in the front row, uh, did the trail in 48. But over the next quarter century, um, between 30 and 40, people did the whole trail in a single season. So, so very few, but, but anyway, by 1972, you had enough for a group picture. And the following year, usage on the AT spiked. Um, Ed Garvey, who has the glass case in the front row, um, came out with the book, Appalachian uh, Hiker. And it was one of the first kind of through hiking books. And it was, there was a story about him on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and then um, National Geographic did something, and it was reprinted in Reader's Digest. So that publicity really spiked usage in, in the AT. So about 85 people did the whole trail in uh, 1973. Grandma Gatewood's the one standing up with the boy. So um, th this signs from a uh, Smithsonian exhibit on, on Earl Schaefer in, in 2009. Um, 
here you see Earl finishing on top of the baton in uh, 1948, August of 48. And National Geographic featured him in a story, and that resulted in kind of the initial publicity for the AT. This, um, this, this is his uh, diary of that 48 hike. And with this and, and some of his other artifacts, um, they're in the Smithsonian collection. We did get second dip, so we have a lot of uh, Earl Schaefer stuff in the museum. You know, I've been on the Earl Schaefer Foundation for over 20 years. So th these boots are also uh, in the Smithsonian. They, these uh, Russell Moccasin boots, uh, bird shooter boots, were um, what, what he wore for a good bit of the hike. And uh, as an anniversary uh, item, Russell came out with a, a similar pair of boots uh, last year, but I'm sure Earl would have never paid <laughs> what these boots cost. Mm -hmm. So, so here you see a number of artifacts of, of Earl's in the, the museum. Walking with Spring was his account of the 48 hike, and this is a, a book he hand bound. Um, so we do have some of those for sale. And and he he uh, a lot of his equipments here. Um, he had that pith helmet. He would served in the Pacific in World War II, and you know, used a lot of his old uh, army equipment you know, for that tour. Uh, Gene Espy, who's still alive uh, in his upper nineties, was the second through hiker uh, from Georgia. He hiked in 1951, and here, here's Gene as a 29-year-old. Uh, when he was finishing the, the trail in Maine, somebody said, uh, there goes a spry old man in, in, <laughs> in his 20s. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, Gene did a lot of adventures when, when he was young. But after that, that 51 through hike, he raised the family and never backpacked again until 1981. He did a weekend backpack in 1981. <laughs> Grandma Gatewood. Um, from uh, Ohio, uh, Gallipolis, so Ohio, and Southern Ohio. Didn't have a backpack. She, she had various uh, kind of satchels that she carried over her shoulder. Um, had was very lightweight hiker. She would carry between 15 and 25 pounds and, and very primitive equipment. So this is her exhibit at, at the museum. Um, you know, she was a great grandmother when she started the trail, and um, I used to say she was an elderly lady. Now I said she was relatively young. She was only <laughs> sixty-seven when she, she did the trail for the the fir first time. But 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 a, a great grandmother. She had eleven kids, and the last of her kids just died uh, fairly recently. She she died uh, not long after that picture was taken in nineteen seventy-three in her, her mid 80s. So she was known for um, cats, you know, on her uh, first through hike in 1955, she, she went through a half a dozen pairs of sneakers. You can see she had a little Band-Aid can where she had some, some odds and ends. And there's a, a copy of Ed Garvey's book um, and um, autographed for Grandma Gatewood. You know, and, and one of her satchels. Trail Days uh, parade in, in Damascus, Virginia. Uh, the, the year before uh, the museum opened, uh, the museum was, was featured um, in the hiker parade at, at, at Trail Days. Um, I was Grand Marshal, which meant that I was the main target for the water balloons. <laughs> uh, walking Jim Stoll's um, he he through hiked um, in in 1974, and and one of the other only articles that made the front page of the Wall Street Journal, they called uh, Jim the the troubadour of, of the AT, and he continued walking for the rest of his life. Tragically, he he died young in his late uh, 50s, but he's uh, a member of the Hall of Fame, and we have an exhibit. Um, we have. Uh, he, he always, he composed songs while he was hiking and he had a backpacking guitar. 
and he credited that that was saving his life. He was doing a cross-country walk across the north of the, the United States. Um, and one very cold night, I think he was in Wisconsin, it was the night the, um, what was it, the uh, the Fitzgerald, the, there's the, the song. Edmund Fitzgerald? The, the what? The Edmund Fitzgerald. The night the Edmund sang, Fitzgerald the sang. sang. Yeah, he slipped on the ice and he credited the backpacking guitar was saving his life then. So a really cool. Um, when we were first um, working on the museum, we hadn't gotten a construction permit yet. And, and the Appalachian Long Distance Hikers had a um, gathering in, in Gettysburg College. And this was Columbus Day weekend and they would always try to have a work trip after the gathering. So, so we had this motley crew cleaning out the, the building. And we, the, this is, uh, you know, the, the old mill uh, in Pine Grove Furnace Park. And uh, we filled up uh, a dump truck and a half with, with debris from, from the building. And the, the dump truck driver, the park employee said he never thought the building would get so clean. We didn't get our construction permit until February, and then we actually got our volunteer crew in, in in March. And we were planning to open on June 5th. So we had two months to, to renovate the, the building, put together our exhibits, and, and so forth. It was real crunch time. What's you know? the story with the hat? Oh, the, no, 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 no real significance. People just wanted to, to show that they, they had the party spirit. You know, so that, you know, I'm, I'm the most boring conservative person in the world, and they have me wearing the Hawaiian light. <laughs> the, the, the person who uh, narrated that video, Jim Foster, uh, had a mop that day, and he was actually mopping the, the ceiling. People just showed up, and they brought their mops and everything, you know, scoured the building. So, so this is what we were dealing with. This is two months before our grand open. You know, and uh, we, we had a crew mostly from PATC and um, Al Black is a uh, great, you know, professional construction guy, uh, spearheaded him. This, um, our exhibit designer was using this to do uh, a mock-up you know, and before you saw what these finished exhibits like look like now, they look great. <laughs> this is the before. And that's our uh, exhibit designer initially. So we've put together a really talented group of, of volunteers. So th this was, I think, November of 2009, about the six months before we opened. And this woman, Bonnie Ralston, got in touch with me and she said, you know, I just did a through hike and I'm, you know, I've worked at the Museum of Modern Art in Manhattan and I'd like to help with the exhibits. And I said, we have no budget. And she said, I'm a volunteer. <laughs> so we had a world-class exhibit designer, you know, you know, for free. That That's Al Black and, and the crew. I put up a little bit of the sheetrock, but the, the rest of it's straight. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, the guy with the red the bandana was, this is in uh, Cook Township, you know, it's a township of 130 people. Um, he, Bill Jones, uh, with the guy with the red bandana, was one of the three township supervisors. <laughs> so, so we didn't have any problems with the township. We, we, we did have problems. Um, we're a nonprofit in a state building. So we're supervised by the Department of Labor and Industry in Harrisburg, and, and they can be a real terror. <laughs> so this is Wednesday morning. We're opening Saturday at 11 o'clock. This is Wednesday at like 10 in the morning. Doesn't look ready for 750 people to show up on Saturday. <laughs> but, you know, the... They started installing the exhibits, the exhibit cases. Um, the Smithsonian lent us um, some panels from that Earl Schaefer exhibit the, the previous year. These are, um, uh, Bob was uh, 
a, a chapter president of the PATC in the Carlisle area. The guy on the right, I met at Trail Days a couple years before, and his name's uh, uh, Bill Speed, and he's a two-time through hiker. And at Trail Days, he said, you know, I live in, in Perry County and only an hour to the museum. If you, if you ever need any help, let me know. Uh, and he was a commercial HVAC guy. So two years later, I called him up and I said, <laughs> we're ready to do the, the plumbing. And, and he came and, and did all the plumbing for us. Unfortunately, then we moved to North Carolina. So it was a one shot. I tried to get him not to. <laughs> so, so we're getting ready for the grand opening. Um, what one of the through hikers from Florida just showed up with that green banner. You know, somebody else showed up with the flag. On, on the right is the halfway marker and been up on the Pole Steeple Mountain for 25 years. And, you know, the, the trail, the geographic center of the trail kept moving south because of relocations each year. And about three or four months before the museum opened, I started getting calls and then people were telling me somebody um, stole the halfway mark. <laughs> I got three or four calls like that. And then I, I showed up at a DETC chapter meeting at Gypsy Spring Cabin, and the guy came over to me and he said, you know, we took down the halfway marker and we're saving it for you at the museum. <laughs> so then that solved the mystery of that theft. Um, Tara Sperry, who was uh, with the uh, vice chair of ATC, uh, president of ATA, and lots of other stuff, uh, Barb, anything to add about Tira? Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, she and her husband, Dick Mark, you know, very early supporters of the museum. <laughs> this is uh, the grand opening. Um, King's Gap Park lent us this tent. And um, this, this is in the field below the museum. So um, we, we actually got our certificate of occupancy 25 hours before this mm -hmm. Friday morning. We, we had two last things to complete. We needed a, a soap dish in the bathroom, mm -hmm. and we needed a sign in Braille on the bathroom that said restroom in, in Braille. And we got those things Friday morning and got our certificate of occupancy. So 25 hours before this crowd showed up, mm -hmm. uh, we got our CFO. So we were able to put them through the museum on the grand opening day. It's still the largest crowd we've ever had. Um, but without that CFO, these people would have been very disappointed and I would have skedaddled. Okay. Um, Earl Schaefer's brother in that white t-shirt in the, the, the front row, uh, John Schaefer, you, you probably knew Barb. Um, uh, some of Grandma Gatewood's uh, daughters were there. You know, lots of other celebrities. Um, the, we had, instead of a ribbon cutting to dedicate the museum, we had a duct tape cutting. Yeah. <laughs> and and the the kid who's doing the the, the duct tape cutting, um, his his parents were trail maintainers and, and real AT aficionados. So he's named Benton Mackay Schwartz. <laughs> yes, that's your son. <laughs> we need to talk after. But I, I saw him at, at Colby College. He was a, a student at the University of Maine. Yeah, and I'd like to hear what he's doing now. <laughs> you know, in the, in the back, uh, the, the head of DCNR and um, the Rick Ravino County Commissioner from Cumberland County. So these are, are two of uh, Grandma Gatewood's 11 children. The one on the right, Lucy, was her, her youngest daughter and kind of the mm -hmm. keeper of the flame. Uh, Lucy passed about a year ago in, in the 90s. So this was the, the, the waiting line, you know, at the grand opening of the museum. You know, and we would worked on this idea of the museum for 12 years. And until the day before, we'd never given a, a thought to crown control. We'd mm -hmm. always been thinking, well, what if we build it and nobody shows up? You know, my nightmare, I went to the to the Lumber Museum on Route 6 near Powersport, and, and I was there on a Saturday, and, I, you know, there were three staff and me, 
and that was my nightmare. I never dreamed we'd have to worry about uh, controlling staff and figuring out how to get 700 people through the museum in one day. Uh, we talked about the half gallon club. This is the Pine Grove Furnace store next door. Um, Carol Croxton, um, who was, was he from Allentown? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so we had a hike to the museum, the hike for history at the grand opening day. And Harold, I think, was 89 in this picture and did that, that six mile hike. And Harold put up more sheetrock than I did and did it straighter too. Yeah. And also donated books and other things. Harold would be 104 in August. Right? He's still alive. alive. Of course he's still alive. Okay. Yes. <laughs> he, he's, he's going to serve speedy. <laughs> Holy cow. Yes. Because they forced him to use a wall. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. D Dick Martin, that's the uh, halfway, um, the, the, the center point knob the flat. The, the picture on the right, you know, I showed earlier, that's the, the 1972 uh, Plymouth, New Hampshire picture, Grandma Gatewood in the foreground. The Katahdin Sun. This was the Earl Schaefer shelter. This was on uh, Peters Mountain, you know, um, northeast of, of um, Harrisburg. And on, I think it was the 60th anniversary of Earl's through hike, we did a ceremony and took this apart piece by piece and, and brought it out three miles to the trailhead. And it took us a couple of years to get National Park Service and Chippo and all, all these other permissions to take it down. And they wanted to make sure we were going to take good care of it and everything. And a year later, there were two blowdowns on that site. There wouldn't have been a splinter allowed <laughs> if, if we hadn't taken out. But it, anyway, this is a, a shelter Earl built in 1960. He he built a half a dozen shelters on on the AT uh, in central Pennsylvania. And we we have this one and now a a, a stone shelter that we just uh, constructed outside the museum last year. So those are the only two surviving ones that are all built. And you can see he was picky about his construction materials. As long as they were free, <laughs> he, he was good. Yeah, so this is uh, the, the site, uh, you know, the, the shape of shelter in the woods. And this is where we had our ceremony. And one of the great mysteries of the museum one one of those logs disappeared. We had 40 people for the ceremony and we disassembled it and we took it out to the parking lot, log by log, three miles away. We all went out one way and by mid-afternoon, one of the logs was missing. Um, we've never solved that, although a few years later, we did get kind of a ransom note about the log, but but never. So, so I, I got the letter and, and at the same time, Steve Parody, who's in the very right of the picture, he was uh, number two at ATC, got the same handsome note. No, no actual demand, but it, you know, cut up letters, you know, with that. Oh, so, um, the, the, the guy in the foreground, uh, the bag of tricks, he's holding a, a hammer that Earl Schaefer had, had uh, given him. And we we always blamed uh, Trex for stealing that log, but, <laughs> but no evidence, so he's been cleared. And a lot of these people, uh, there were some people from, from Blue Mountain Eagle. Um, Karen Balaban was SATC president at the time, so a lot of uh, SATC folks too. Here's proof I did a little actual work that day. <laughs> and uh, in the middle, uh, with a blue shirt, uh, Dave Donaldson. He co-wrote the the uh, biography of Earl Schaefer that the, the museum has published, along with uh, Maurice Forrester, the longtime uh, president of uh, KTA. Here's the halfway marker right outside the museum, and we we have the the duplicate or the original of the halfway marker is on the porch of the museum. This is a duplicate that Chuck Wood, who's got the jacket with all those uh, the patches, um, made the original, made the duplicate. And, and here we we put the um, 
the, the duplicate into the woods, you know, and cement. So this reminded me of the uh, flag racing on Mount Suribachi. <laughs> Um, at Harper's Ferry, starting in 1979, they, they would take a Polaroid picture of, of every through hiker at the psychological halfway mark of, of the AT. And, and at one point, we, we got a grant to digitize all those photos. So, so one at a time, we digitized 12,000 photos. And there's a website, athikerpictures.org, and we also want to know the loop at the MEC. So Terry Wilson did the bulk of that digitizing. Um, we we do various programs at, at the, the museum, and hopefully we're going to have another author than <laughs> uh, the audience here speaking at the museum. But this is the Barefoot Sisters. So they did two thirds of the trail barefoot, mm -hmm. and when they the it got into deep winter, they had to put on shoes because not because the winter bothered them, but because the heat from their shoes, uh, from their feet melted the ice and it got too slippery, so they had to wear mm -hmm. shoes <laughs> for yes. a little bit. But anyway, we got 100 people for, for that program, the biggest uh, we've, we've ever had. Here's another program inside the museum. <laughs> Now you, you can see um, Gene Espy on, on the left. And we've actually had pictures of, of Gene Espy in front of that and, and uh, a sculptor. Um, you can see on the fireplace, there's a wooden uh, figure of, of Gene's head. So we have a picture of him in front of that, that head too. This, this is when the museum was featured at Trail Day. So that was the t-shirt and information about the museum. And that's it. And Greg and I'd be happy to take questions. So I'm curious about the ransom note for the log. What exactly did you say? Did you have your log and must it, it, it no, it wasn't. It wasn't direct like that, and there was no demand or anything. But it was a picture of the log in the sunshine and grass, and it was postmarked in Florida, and, <laughs> and no real message. Um, and that's the last we've ever heard. So, so you know that that's going back almost 15 years now. So, so we have had a few mysteries associated with the museum. Yeah. Uh, what was the? Uh, did, did we have the big the Janice of, of the your idea of, 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 of trying to get, get in Appalachian buildings and stuff. Great question. Um, so so I did research on my book in 1993. My, my book now is 30 years old. Um, and when I was doing research in, in Harper's Ferry, um, they put me in a, in a little like storage room and it had Ben Mackay's desk, Ben Mackay's books loosely on the shelf. And, and the archives were, were kind of a mess back then. And I, and I was horrified. I'm not a museum person, but it just seemed like nothing was being done to preserve the, the history of the trail. And ATC, you know, to protect the trail, that's their primary mission, and it's a difficult mission. And, and as an institution, they didn't have enough energy to, to to go out and collect artifacts and, and put together a museum. So, so that was the, the genesis of the idea. So that was 1993. And then in 1998, when we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Earl's through hike at an Appalachian long distance hikers gathering, um, in preparation for that, I mentioned the idea at a, at a meeting of the, the oldest steering committee. And usually when you come out with an idea, everybody says that's stupid. Forget about it. And to, to my eternal regret, everybody said, this is a great idea, Larry, and here's what you should do. And they started giving me assignments. And we had more meetings, and I got more assignments. And and it, it kind of took hold. You know, it, it fit the AT community. 
you mentioned the, the archives. What kind of condition are you in now? It's been a number of years since I've used them. So, so they're in much better shape because um, George Mason University took them over. Wow. And Professor Mills Kelly, you know, who's, who's a great researcher and so forth and really knows what he's doing, you know, is in charge of the archives, at least until he retires next year. And where are they located now? At, at George Mason. So, so they moved them. So, so they've been moved to George Mason. You know, it's it's at Fairfax County outside DC. Because mm -hmm. when I use them, they were in a an outside storage facility. You know. Oh, in Charlestown. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there wasn't a lot of attention. I mean, no. Tom Johnson got involved, and you know, there were other people who put them in better shape than than when I was first there in '93. But it, but it was something that ATC was never going to devote enough energy to, you know. So so other archives are scattered, and and Tom Johnson who did a, a great book on the trail. I think it's the definitive history on the trail before he unfortunately passed at, at eighty. He visited all the club archives, and and they're scattered. You know, Maine at, at AT is in the State Library in Maine. Um, Mount Club of Maryland is the state archives in Annapolis and so forth, but but there's a, a great archive at, at George Mason. I, I should mention uh, the library at the, the AT Museum. You know, um, we have around 3,000 books and other publications, and many of them don't have library Congress numbers. So, um, and if they did, it would just be one of them. So, so anyway, we had a retired lead research librarian who developed her own brain system. But anyway, it's the most complete collection of, of AT materials any place. Might be worth mentioning since we're talking about AT books. Um, this is the latest book from last year uh, put out by the museum. It's called the Hiker Yearbook. This has been put out by Odie, a very popular figure on the trail for maybe 10 years. And uh, this year was a transition year, that is 2023. It was a transition year to where Odie would work with the museum to bring it out. The concept behind, behind the hikers uh, yearbook is that uh, hikers will finish the trail and end up knowing one another by their, by their trail names and have no email address or have no phone number, get in touch with people. So this becomes a way for them to get back in touch. And their pictures are all the, mainly the book is their pictures hikers photos and then at the end you'll have uh, their contact information so that if you wanted to search and you want to look up somebody who's important to you that you met on the trail you can do that in this way so similar to a high school yearbook but uh, having a, a dedicated purpose and next year will be the first year that we take it over for um, you know the museum to take it over. Yeah so we have published about uh, 10 books so far, and it's always been people approached us. And, uh, oh, and, you know, we, we didn't mention the hiker hostel. So um, in 2019, the state park asked us to take over the hostel. They'd been struggling with it for years. So so we took over the hiker hostel in, in January 2020. And, and if you can recall, there was a global <laughs> pandemic the following month. So not the best time to go into the hospitality business. Um, but, but, but anyway, we did manage to break even that year. We opened June 13th and, uh, uh, you know, so, so we are operating the hiker hostel too. You, you could say it's mission free, but, <laughs> but, but anyway, we're done. He has also worked with Alda. Yeah, so so Alda kind of nurtured us in, initially from from that inception in 1998, and um, our our bylaws provide for for two Alda reps on the board. So we've always had two Alda reps. Alda incubated our treasury initially, and you know we. For many years, we had a symposium at the Alda Gathering and so forth. So we've all, you know, a lot of our board members are all the people, including me. So, so there's been, you, you know, we're we're a small group, and we partnered with Alda and ATC and KTA and lots of other groups. You know, when you're small, you need all the help you can get. You know, and, and tons of volunteers. 
doing everything from cutting the grass to exhibits to oral history. Well, I wanted to thank Larry for coming. Uh, it's appreciated. Thank you.